The Chronicles of Osiris, set down in the house of El Eros, El Eroa, they bring male and female born according to the laws governing the Dumon Adamic race, this being their fourth incarnation. The Lamentation of Horus over the Destruction of Atlantis O Chekon, thou golden city of Atlantis, thy towers are overthrown and thine altars are buried beneath the waves of the mighty ocean. Thy sanctuaries became a habitation for jackals and vipers, and the highways become streets of inequity. Behold, the word of Ta was spoken, and the earth opened wide its mouth and swallowed those evil ones that not one remained. Alas, ye golden domes and glistening columns, weep for the destruction that has come upon you. Weep for all eternity, for in thy awful desolation shalt thou rise up again from thy watery grave. Behold, thy voice shall be like unto the voice of the harlot crying aloud and saying, Behold, out of my whoredom hath come destruction. Take heed, ye nations of earth, lest ye fall into greater tribulation. The fair city of Chacon, the first city of Atlantis, is overthrown. The habitation of Ta is no more. Chapter 1 In the great days of Atlantis, which were before the coming of the great flood, which was the final punishment meted out to those evil ones, all men lived at peace with one another. The continent was divided into three sections, partly on account of its geographical nature and partly because of the decree of Ta. It was after the destruction of that evil continent called Sarkon, or Lemuria, that my father Ta did collect together all those divine sparks who were to escape the destruction which finally swept Sarkon away. They were taken to Atlantis, which was at that time ripe to receive the evolving life of the world called Earth. This I have told you in the Book of Truth, which has already been given unto you, my children. The Duman men and women lived and mixed with the sons and daughters of Yahweh, and they were all teachers to their less evolved brothers of earth. All was according to the word of my father Ta, which had been given unto him by the blessed Cosmos. My father chose from amongst the Ray children twenty-four son daughters, who were to help him in his plans for the evolving divine spark. Temples were built, and places of worship were inaugurated, having as their visible sign the disk of the living sun, of whom the Lord is Horus Atanu. He, acting as the mediator between the men of earth and the Father, Mother, Son, God. These temples were built of a white shining stone, which was common in Atlantis, and which was very durable. They were always to consist of the outer court of the priests and teachers and the three subterranean chambers, which were in the same in character as those built at a later date of Camus, and referred to in the Book of Truth. Twenty-four of these temples were built, one chief cathedral of initiation in the sacred heights, and the remainder in the tablelands and the lowlands. Over each temple was placed one of the twenty-four initiates or ray children, whom I have already mentioned as being chosen by my father Ta for the execution of his will. I would here give you a short explanation as to the actual relative position held by my father's teachers whom he had chosen, and I would also define exactly the position held by my father Ta El Duad and his actual manifestation to the people. The time that I now speak of, my beloved children, is that great and glorious period before the times of bitter hate and tribulation which came later, and that because these men had brought it upon themselves. For a moment I will take you to the continent of Sarkon. This evil place has been entirely destroyed according to the word of the cosmos manifested to the medium of El Duad and his twin and spouse eternal who is El Duo the same who I have called Evum in my Book of Truth. The actual disintegration of the great continent was over a period of many thousands of years of Earth time, and was accomplished as the outcome of a series of volcanic disturbances which gradually undermined the substrata comprising the foundation of that continent. The disaster was brought about on account of the Satanakuic domination exercised by Aranus and his followers. Black magic was rife, and the chances of those who still remained steadfast to the cause of divine evolution were almost hopeless. The final great upheaval was caused by an immense crater or fissure about three miles in circumference, being rent in the center of the continent. 
From this fissure, suffocating gases were poured into the atmosphere, and being of a heavy nature, these gases hung low over the continent. Spreading out in all directions and before the submersion actually took place, the entire life of the continent was obliterated. Only those who were to be collected in Atlantis being saved in order to, during previous periods to proceed into that continent. Having described to you briefly the destruction of Sarkon, I shall proceed with the state of evolution in Atlantis. My children, during the last years of life in Sarkon, my father had been preparing the continent of Atlantis to receive the life of the world, for he had been plainly told by the cosmos that Sarkon must be obliterated. His first care was the organization of the crown of Atlantis. This was the cathedral which was built at his command in the sacred heights. I shall here give a brief description of it as follows. It was situated in the heart of the high mountains beyond the tablelands and was inaccessible to those who knew not the power of levitation. It was surrounded by seven great peaks, which represented the seven pillars of the universe, and in the center thereof nestled this great house of initiation, the only visible sign being the head and front paws of the gigantic sphinx which guarded the eastern entrance. Between the paws of the sphinx was an immense iron door, through which, when opened, force would be directed downward upon the tablelands, where the uninitiated population was ordered to gather for worship ever so often during the year. The main structure, which was above ground and situated in the basin formed by the seven peaks, was connected with the sphinx by a tunnel which was about one hundred yards in length and semicircular in section. The structure itself was all built of white sewn stone found in the lattice and used because of its absolute durability and resistance to the action of the elements. It was round when viewed generally, but in reality it had twenty-four sides and was surrounded by pillars placed at each angle, formed by the junction of the walls. The ceiling was slightly dome-shaped, although at first sight it had the appearance of being flat. Upon the very center of this dome was a disk of the living son of Horus Atenu, and it was depicted as having seven hands reaching out therefrom towards the solar universe. This symbol was to represent the sun collecting all the vital force from the fountainhead of the cosmos which dwells within the circle of the conscious universe. To return to the interior of this chamber, which was really a huge circular-shaped temple, I shall describe for you, my children, the ornamentation and furniture which comprised the interior. In the center of the floor, which was of marble, was a gigantic pattern of the sun's disk, with the seven hands reaching out, and the very center of the sun was the head of Ta, El-Duad, el Dua, and they were represented in the form of a sphinx. Remember, my children, that this was not symbolizing Ta as a deity who was to be worshipped. It only symbolized him as the father king initiate, and he held the same position as I've already explained to you in my Book of Truth. The altar or table of initiation was placed over against the east wall of this twenty-four-sided chamber, and was of cedar wood, which was a common product of the highlands of Atlantis. The symbols upon it were as follows. The front had engraven upon it the symbol of the world called Earth, which was enclosed within a heart. Upon the top of this world was a cup-shaped flower, out of the center of which watched the all-seeing eye of the inner circle of the cosmic mysteries, and from out of the very top of this symbol were four great strands, or rays, of vitally emanating from the eye, symbolizing the flow of vitality, knowledge, and love to the conscious universe. This whole symbol represented the trinity of the cosmic force. Upon the altar's top were various chalices and cups for the drinking of the juice of the orange and the breaking of the bread, which were used at the communion of remembrance. These vessels and plates need not be described unto you, my children, as they will not be important except for you to know that they were there. This chamber, being the outward and visible edifice, was used by the initiates and helpers who had been chosen from amongst the Ray children and Duman Adamics by my father Ta. All matters of administration and legislation were drawn up in this chamber, and it was also used as a chamber of worship when occasion so required. I shall not go into the explanation of the three subterranean chambers, as they were almost exactly the same as those used in the temple in Camus, described in the Book of Truth the only exception being that the pillars were plain and were not sculpted as were those of the Temple of Camus. 
The sacred temple language was, however, used upon the pillars of the various chambers when it became necessary to the process of initiation. My father Ta was the chief of this temple, although he did not wear the mortal garment of flesh as did the various ray children and Duman Adamics in authority under him. Nay, he still retained the divine body of heaven, the skin coat, as did his twins and spouse eternal, and those two did even function together as one perfect whole. At this point, O oh my children, I would tell you of the father's viceroys for Atlantis, and also the ray children chosen to be mortal head of that continent. My children, it was I who was chosen by my father to carry out his commands, and I did wear the mortal body of sin, even as I did at the latter day of Camus, as you have already read in my Book of Truth. The only difference being that my twin eternal Isis was incarnate with me, and did bear unto the mortal flesh the child Horus, who was the chief of the cathedral of the tablelands of Atlantis. To him were given all matters connected with the choosing and administration of the priesthood. In fact, the entire administration of Atlantis was under his direct care and supervision, and he did mix with the evolving population, which was at that time peaceful and loving to one another. My children, at this point I would touch upon the nourishment taken by all who lived in Atlantis. Remember the act of slaughtering mortal flesh to nourish the human body was a thing unheard of at that period of Earth's evolution. At a later stage of this my book I shall explain how that evil practice came about. The entire population of Atlantis was nourished by the vegetable and fruit life of the continent. Cakes of flour and sweet meal were made, also was the milk of the cow used in various ways, even as is the custom among the nations of earth at your present time of incarnation. Spiritual nourishment was also inhaled from the scent of the beautiful flowers which abounded in Atlantis, and these flowers all appeared in their natural beauty, and were not inbred in any manner whatsoever. They grew wild and gave off their fragrant perfume to the air untended by a man's hand, all the pasture land was natural and beautiful, and the animal and insect life were kindly and friendly one to another. The act of killing was unknown. Also, each form of life had its use and its work to accomplish, from the most highly evolved Adamic to the least evolved grub of the soil. The population lived mostly out of doors, for the climate conditions were ideal. The rainy periods with which for the nourishing of the soil were also at fixed seasons, and at these times the inhabitants used the protection of their homes and I would like to take this opportunity of describing them to you. First of all, the population was divided up into clans, there being twenty-four clans in all. Over each clan was a chief man or king, and he was responsible to the special initiate placed over his clan. Each clan carried out its building operation, and it was entirely separate and did not interfere with its neighbor. The buildings were all of the same white stone which I have already mentioned. Some of you may ask how it is possible for them to build houses of stone when they had not the instruments. My children, the evolution of Atlantis proceeded for many thousands of years of earth time, and at first the population lived in the fields and used houses built of mud and reed. But when the period of which I now speak was reached, they had arrived at a state of evolution, when they had at their command all your modern appliances, and also many that you of present civilized world have never yet thought of. Chapter 2 My children, I would set before you in this chapter what took place in Atlantis after the period of evolving prosperity had proceeded for many centuries. The particular twenty-four initiates, all ray children, were the same as those mentioned in the final chapter of my Book of Truth. The Cathedral of the Sacred Heights was administered by me, who am Osiris, and I was incarnate in immortal flesh and was also my spouse eternal Isis. The Cathedral of the Tablelands and Lowlands, which were together under one chief initiate, my beloved son, was administered by El Potiferu, and he was the same that I have mentioned in my Book of Truth. Also was his spouse eternal incarnate with him, and she was also known as El Potiferua. So, my children, you will see that the twenty-four initiates were divided into two groups of twelve, one group being administered by me, Osiris, and the other by the thirteenth initiate, El Potiferu. Alas, it was in the lower lands towards the seaboard of the continent that the evil of Oranus, Satanaku, first manifested itself. I shall try to give you a clear description of what took place. 
I need not go into the prosperous period which preceded this time, because I can leave you to construct this for yourself. One, there was a dwelling in the lowlands of Atlantis, he being the same child of Yahweh, who is mentioned in my Book of Truth, as the first usurper, Karo Palalakas, and Atlantis he was known by the name of Ithboleth, which signified one dominated by ambition and self-will. He was tall and goodly to look upon, and in the past had done much good work for my father Ta el Duad. He was a priest of the outer court of the twenty-four temple of the lowlands, and his master was one Nisu. Alas, my children, had the time come when Saturn was to be allowed to try the people to see who were worthy. The intuitive mind of Ithaboloth was ever thinking within himself, and sometimes it occurred to him that he had as much knowledge as his chief Nisu. Also was Nisu a little indiscreet in his trust, and he was moved to speak too openly in the presence of Ithaboth. Thus was all the harm wrought and the seed of dissension sown. Ithboleth had a plan of action whereby the teachings of the mysteries of the sacred height were to be made more public, and from what he had gathered from Nisu was he able to start and form a secret sect which he called the Initiates of the Lowlands. My children, you can see what was bound to be the outcome of this folly. The society grew throughout the length and breadth of Atlantis, nor was it confined to the Lowlands alone, but the Tablelands became affected. At the length this secret sect became so powerful that we were able to defy openly the existing form of administration. Through the knowledge which Ithboleth had gained from the indiscreet and trusting Nisu, was he able to turn many of the more material mysteries to his own use, which, alas, developed into black magic, which was a thing after the vile heart of Aranus or Satnaku. Ithboleth was also able to dominate his followers, that actual open revolt broke out and the first mortal blood was spilled. The domination of Ithboleth grew, and then came crime and destruction to the continent of Atlantis. It was during this period when Saturn was trying the people that the subtle brain of Satanaku was planning and striving to overthrow the divine state then existing. His method were as follows. He superimposed his will upon the will of Ithboleth, and at first sight it looked as if the divine laws and mysteries were being operated through Ithboloth. Satanatku caused him to build sanctuaries of initiation in the lowlands of the continent, until finally these sanctuaries and temples outnumbered those of my father Ta el Duad. These temples were also built with subterranean chambers, even as was the one of the sacred heights. My children, in these subterranean passages were Satanatku, and as astral entities of evil, able to manifest to the uninitiated population. And by these seeming miracles were they able to poison their minds, so that they forsook the true teachings of my father's teachings, and followed after Satnaku, who promised them all sorts of rewards in return for the trust and obedience they placed in him. It was in these temples of black magic that Satnaku first ordered the human sacrifice to be offered up, and this I have detailed more fully in the Book of Truth. The people were also told that if they killed and consumed the flesh of the cattle, they would become as God themselves, never knowing death. So you can see how evil was wrought, and how the act of slaughtering mortal flesh was first started. Alas, the mischief did not stop here, for the kings of the clan made ward upon each other, and from this was another evil born, the desire for enlarging material possessions and obtaining material pomp at the expense of others. All this gradually accumulated until finally the cancer had spread throughout the lowlands and tablelands of Atlantis. However, the worst blow was yet to come. One day was the continent of Atlantis to awaken to a most terrible dawn. Ithboloth had for a long time been collecting various clans together, who were favorable to his becoming King Initiate of Atlantis. Alas, the day came which found this army on the move. They marched from the lowlands and the tablelands driving towards the heights all those who opposed their progress in any manner whatsoever. The sacred temples fell, and the vessels and ornaments of initiation were plundered. Many of the masters fell in their temples, as did Nisu, upon the sword of a supposed friend, Ithboleth. Some were able to make their way to the sacred heights, which were quite inaccessible to the armies of the people. Then was it that my father Ta raised his voice, 
and standing between the paws of the great sphinx of the highlands, cried out into the cosmos, saying, O thou fountain of all wisdom and knowledge, what shall I do unto these people, who have outraged the shrines of the Most High? Show me thy command, that I may bring thy just reward upon thy heads for ever. Then did the populace behold, and their tongues were stopped, for the ground did tremble, and a mist filled all the tablelands, and stretched even unto the seaboard of the lowlands. And the earth was rent, that the great tongues of fire rose up, consuming all those who came within their grasp. On that terrible day, my children, many were swallowed up, and the remainder hid their faces and fled unto their own abodes. Then were the commands of my father made known unto them through me, O Cyrus, and I gave unto my eleventh descendant, who is Erosufu, the statutes of my father Ta, and he was chosen to be my father's word unto the people. Chapter 3 My children, I would tell you in this chapter about the delivering of the statutes unto the people of Atlantis. The rebellion of Ithbaloth had been quelled, and the people, realizing their awful guilt, sought safety in prayer. For my children, it has always been the way of mankind that in the hour of this bitter tribulation they have called unto the Father, Mother God, who has heard their cry. So did the people then, and my father, hearkening unto the voice of El Duad, did draw up the statutes of Ta, which are set down in my book of truth. And they were as a warning unto these children of Atlantis, and told them of the thing that might expect from time to time. For evil had again manifested itself, also was it impossible to check it entirely, as many had sought safety in flight, and had migrated into the continents of Africa and America after the first earthquake in Atlantis. The damage done was very great, and the number of people swallowed up exceeded a hundred and forty thousand souls. My father, Ta El Duad, administered the continent of Atlantis as follows. Me, Osiris, he sent unto the continent called Africa, and my headquarters were made in the land of Camus. My place in Atlantis was taken by my beloved son Horus, who administered the divine laws in the cathedral of the sacred heights. Alas, the incarnate initiates of the lowlands and tablelands had nearly all perished in the insurrection caused by Ithboleth, he himself being swallowed up in the great fissure which appeared in the earth during these fateful days. The administrator of the cathedral of the tablelands and lowlands did also perish and fell into the sanctuary's temple. So, my children, you will see how the raid children of my father Ta and his loyal Adamic family were to suffer martyrdom for the cause of the divine cosmos. Atlantis was now placed under the protection of one chief initiate, who was my beloved son Horus, who administered the continent from the seclusion of the sacred heights. His chief emissary, chosen by my father, was El Arosufu, and he was the judge and lawgiver of that continent. His spouse eternal was a carnet with him, and was his ear under the commands of the cosmos. The great prophet or seer of the divine mysteries was the father and mother of El Erosufu, and at the same are written down in the book of truth as Adalomeu and Adalomei. The old temples of the tablelands and lowlands were reestablished and their shrines rebuilt. In many instances the earthquake had been so severe that the temples were reduced to irreparable ruin. So, my children, there was now a complete reorganization of the administration of the continent of Atlantis. The Cathedral of the Sacred Heights was the supreme house of initiation, and those who thought themselves worthy of taking the road of the neophyte were received into that sacred house to start their divine journey to life eternal. The remainder of the continent had its temples, which were under the direct surveillance of the sacred heights, and their chief priests were chosen from among the Adamic population. But never were the secrets of the divine mysteries carried into those parts of the continent. The new regime lasted for many centuries of earth time, and the evil ways of Ithboleth seemed completely forgotten, and his name was only mentioned with horror by those who had recourse to its use. As time passed, the continent of Africa was becoming fertile and cultivated at the hands of those people who had migrated thither at the first earthquake of Atlantis. I must here tell you, my children, that the continent of Africa was not as you know it now, for the desert of Sahara was then submerged under the ocean, and the sea washed against the range of granite escarpment upon which the Sphinx was carved at a later date, 
of which I shall tell you further on. Also was the stone used to build the pyramid's quarried from that same granite foundation. The seaboard ran almost as far south as the modern Kathum, or Kathum, and behind it flowed the river Nile, which rendered the land of Kamu so fertile. The emigrants from Atlantis chose as their chief abode Kamu, and they continued to increase in number until at length quite a large settlement was created. These people were peaceful and lived mostly out of doors, using as houses huts interlarded with reeds. Other immigrants from Atlantis had found their way to what is now Central and South America, and they had gone by way of that small continent called Antilla, the present site of which is the region occupied by West Indies. <laughs>